Thank you again for joining us tonight. I think it's going to be a very exciting night, uh, very interesting cases that we have lined up for you. Uh, really proud of our, uh, all the fellows that have submitted cases. There were over 25 cases that were submitted. Uh, so it was very competitive. And uh, Dr. Banerjee will uh, kind of introduce the winners and I look forward to the cases. I remember that uh, tonight's uh, objectives are listed here. Uh, we are talking about pulmonary embolism. On the first part, we discussed kind of the indications for PERT, impact of PERT, reasons for uh, various uh, treatment algorithms, medical therapy versus uh, intervention versus surgery versus lysis versus systemic lysis. Uh, today, uh, tonight, we're going to get into the A to Z technical aspect of this. How do you do it? What, why this? Why that? Why go here? Why wire? What device? What approach? And those kind of things. Again, remember that this is a, a CME event, and uh, I will share with you how to get your CME points. But before we get to the CME, let me introduce the wonderful panel that we have. I'm very lucky and uh, fortunate uh, that we are able to, tonight to share the experience of experts in this field. Dr. Christopher Hoff, who is a friend, uh, interventional cardiologist from Riverside Methodist Hospital. Um, he's with us tonight. We have Jay Guri. Uh, doesn't need any kind of an introduction from uh, Penn Medicine, uh, who's joining us. And we have my partner, June Lee, who is an interventional cardiologist uh, who does most of our work here uh, related to pulmonary embolism here at University Hospitals here in Cleveland. And then uh, we will be moderating this together, myself and Mary Shishabor and Subhash Banerjee, my partner uh, here, the two of us. Hopefully, we're going to do moderation and learn from you folks and uh, the team here. Remember again that this is uh, uh, the CME event. Uh, there may be some off-label uh, use of the uh, devices discussed and uh, our uh, speakers will discuss this and uh, mention this uh, when they are uh, being used, when, when they are being discussed as off-label. Uh, tonight's uh, CME event was sponsored by Boston Scientific and Inari and we are very grateful to them for their support so that we can educate. And you will see tonight that this is about education. I hope that that's the impression you get. And I give it to Dr. Banerjee. Maybe it's my pleasure. So I think we have uh, an unusual situation where we have selected two cases uh, to be presented by uh, two very young and talented fellows who are going to share the first prize. Uh, and these are uh, two cases, a case of PE in a lung transplant patient will be presented by Dr. Henry Hahn and Dr. Nabil Ahider from University of Michigan. And the second winner of the co-winner of the challenging case contest is going to be Dr. Leah Raj from Emory University. And she's going to present her case on mechanical thrombectomy as a treatment strategy for acute pulmonary embolism in a lung transplant patient. So I hope you enjoy this. We'll have a brief discussion and then maybe take it over and introduce our speakers and we'll launch into the agenda for tonight. Okay, well, let's launch into the agenda. Let's save some time. This is how you get uh, your CME uh, credit. Uh, please uh, uh, also uh, 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 visit our website. I think you will see many of the webinars we have done in the past. You can watch the part one of this. We had over 110, 115 attendees that night. And tonight looks like it's getting close to that too. So, um, uh, I, and there are many other webinars that as part of the CBI that are uh, on the website that you can enjoy, including other educational activities. And obviously you can download your uh, CME event through this website. So with that, I wanna take advantage and uh, move forward. Our next webinar is gonna be on April 14th. Another is a Wednesday night from 9 p.m. Eastern time, 8 p.m. Uh, Central time. And this will be on a synergy of drugs and devices for the treatment of PAD, a concerted approach to improving patients' outcomes. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you guys on April 14th, Wednesday, uh, for this lively webinar. And uh, there's gonna be a, a very high level speakers also for that webinar that we have put together. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen uh, this is our website, www.cvinnovations.org for additional information, as I mentioned. And uh, I want to save time. I'm going to pass this to Dr. Hahn and Dr. Hader uh, for their presentation. 
All right, thanks again to CVI for having us uh, here to share this case with you all, a case of PE in a lung transplant patient. So our patient is a 61-year-old male. He has a history of bilateral lung transplantation in December of 2019 for a diagnosis of IPF. Also has a notable history of uh, prior provoked DVT and PE in 2005, which was managed with six months of warfarin. And our case takes place in December of 2020. Uh, in the month prior to our case, he had a lung herniation repair in early November. Uh, prior to coming to our hospital, he has been experiencing a little bit of increasing dyspnea and dyspnea on exertion. And then early in December 2020 in the morning, uh, one day he has acute onset of some shortness of breath. He has a brief duration of uh, syncope and loss of consciousness. He's at home and his spouse notes that he has a uh, seizure-like activity. The pulse oximeter that he has at home reads a saturation in the mid 80s. So EMS is called and he's transported to the ER. In the ER, he's noted to be tachycardic to 110. The blood pressure is 122 over 88. He is tachypneic to 26. And he is hypoxic requiring two liters of nasal cannula to saturate 96%. On his examination, he is found to be tachypneic, uh, but he has no conversational dyspnea, no other lung sounds are significant. His cardiac exam has tachycardia, but no other significant cardiac findings. On his extremities, he's warm, well perfused, and no signs of DVT. Lab work in the ED, uh, venous blood gas demonstrates a pH of 7.44, PCO2 of 24, and a lactate of 2.8. His CBC is overall unremarkable. Comprehensive panel has some hyperkalemia, a bicarbonate of 17. His D-dimer is elevated at 12. High sensitivity troponin T is initially 110 and uptrends further to 175 at the two hour mark. A brain natriuretic peptide is 335. Uh, since this is COVID era, the COVID PCR is negative. EKG shows sinus tachycardia. An informal echo in the ED shows some RV enlargement and a D sign. We have some limited images here, which uh, I'll just show briefly to demonstrate uh, the enlargement of the RV. And then we have our uh, pulmonary embolism CT here, which shows uh, bilateral lobar PEs extending into the segmental and subsegmental branches. It also demonstrates an enlarged RV to LV ratio. And I will just call your attention to a slight bit of uh, narrowing that's also noted in the right pulmonary artery uh, felt to be related to the prior transplant. With that, I will uh, pass it off to Henry to take you through the rest of the case. Great, thanks, Neil. Um, so in part consultation, uh, we were uh, called for this patient and a uh, patient was felt to be intermediate high risk for PE, uh, given associated hypoxemia, the elevated troponins, the elevated BNP, RV dysfunction noted on imaging, uh, both bedside echo and the CTPE. Um, he was uh, categorized in PESI class three based on age, male and underlying lung disease, as well as his hypoxia. Um, given his stable hemodynamics, uh, we actually opted for a conservative uh, strategy with just anticoagulation alone. Um, we also gave consideration through our PERT discussion for uh, rescue therapy with systemic lytics, given more distal distribution of the thrombus, and then in discussion with our interventional radiology team. Um, and then further workup that we had requested was a formal surface echo and then a DVT uh, ultrasound duplex. So next slide. So hospital day one, the patient has started on low molecular weight heparin, uh, one meg per kg BID and then admitted to the pulmonary service, given that he uh, did have a lung transplant. Uh, DVT ultrasound did find acute right gas tract vein occlusion, as well as acute uh, left-sided um, uh, disease throughout, left popliteal, PT, perineal, and gas tract vein occlusions. 
Um, the vitals following morning uh, did show improvement in his tachycardia. If you remember, he was more 100s, 110s. That was improved to the 90s. Now, blood pressure still remained stable for us, although his respiratory rate, which we'll call attention to, uh, did uh, slowly uptrend over the course of his hospitalization from 26 initially to 35 now, um, though his degree of hy uh, hypoxia remained stable on two liters, 94%. Um, pertinent exam uh, the morning, uh, the following morning then, uh, did show some uh, symptom improvement subjectively based on what the patient was telling us, although uh, we did note some mild to moderate conversational dyspnea after uh, five, six, seven words, he was getting a bit short of breath. So next slide. So hospital day two, um, uh, follow-up PERT recommendations. We said continue the Lovenox for another 24 to 48 hours. Um, again, with instruction, if, if you were to have worsening dyspnea, hypoxia, or other vital sign instability to give systemic lytics. Uh, unfortunately, at 10.15, he does develop acute respiratory distress uh, with now tachypnea up to a respiratory rate of the 40s, and tachycardia then did worsen to the 120s. A bedside ultrasound was done by the overnight providers that did show dilated RV with a flattened septum. Uh, given this decompensation, uh, TPA was requested and called for from the pharmacy. Um, and uh, we actually did call anesthesia on standby as well uh, in case of uh, decompensation for intubation. Um, unfortunately, before he was able to get his TPA therapy, he did have PA arrest at 1045, um, was intubated, uh, ACLS was continued for 20 minutes, and then after discussing with his family, uh, the code was terminated at 1105. So uh, within an hour of his respiratory distress, he had significant decompensation. Next slide. So a few learning points that we just wanted to speak quickly about. We, um, in this case, certainly worsening tachypnea is poor, was a poor prognostic sign in, in, in this patient with pulmonary embolism, uh, despite the patient subjectively telling us that he was feeling less dyspneic and feeling better overall. Um, if you, uh, I'll, I'll call attention back to the um, initial presentation of the case where he had some seizure-like um, activity, and we weren't entirely sure if this was related to syncope that could have been um, because of his hemodynamics of the right heart. Um, and uh, in discussion uh, after the fact, we said if it was closer to the time of evaluation, which in his case it was, it may be more useful than say if he had a more remote uh, episode um, that was similar. Um, and then uh, just a point of, uh, of learning that we, did, we had um, between Nabil and I. Um, in multilobar disease, we, uh, we know that thrombolytic catheters are something that you can use and then uh, uh, and to place them in a single lobe, typically a lower lobe, um, you still get the therapeutic effect uh, from the lytics because other lobes do get perfused. Um, and then uh, in this case, we also uh, mentioned that since the patient could be anticoagulated, guidelines um, said that we should anticoagulate. And so we opted uh, not to have um, an IVC filter placed in this situation too. Next slide. And then a few last learning points, we, um, because this case was in a lung transplanted patient. Um, when we spoke with the pulmonary team and the transplant team, they said outside of the acute surgical period, there was otherwise no increased concern for administration of systemic fibrinolytics. In this patient's case, um, he was more than a year out, more than 12 months out from his lung transplantation period. Um, again, at one year post-transplant, most lung innervation was also um, felt to be in place. And so evaluation of vital signs uh, should be considered within normal ranges of the non-transplanted patient. Um, and then finally, given that the patient back in 2005 did have an episode of uh, PE, um, there was some consideration whether he might have had acute on chronic PE, um, and then some, uh, some angiographic findings that may have helped us differentiate would have been um, uh, acute PE with contrast around the clot, a donut sign where chronic PE um, should be more adherent to the vessel wall. Um, so thin contrast running through the middle. And so um, I think those were all the slides. Um, again, we appreciate this opportunity to present this case. I think we should go to the second case, you think, and then have the Q&A. Would you be okay? Absolutely. I think that would be great. Thank you so much, you know, Dr. Han and Dr. Haider. I'm uh, really proud of you guys for submitting this case because you know, people usually, you know, we focus a lot on devices and wires and balloons, and we learn so much from the cases we don't do. And these cases usually don't even make it to m and You know, if you have complications, they usually always make it. Uh, but, you know, if these kind of cases, a lot of times don't even make it to m and to be honest with you. So thank you. Yes, Dr. Raj, you know, it's your turn. 
uh, let's hear about your case. Thank you so much. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks, Justice CBI, for the opportunity to present the case, and I'll jump right in. Uh, so this is a 66-year-old gentleman with a history of severe COPD who underwent a bilateral orthotopic lung transplant. There were no immediate post-op complications, but his hospital course was prolonged due to some gastroparesis. Three weeks later, the patient developed increased work of breathing. He was to kipnic to 22 respirations a minute. He desaturated 88% of room air. I had a chest x-ray that was unremarkable and significant lab values included a normal creatinine, um, a borderline elevated troponin, hemoglobin of nine and a D-dimer above 15,000. He got a CTPA here, um, which was performed confirming an extensive um, pulmonary embolus burden uh, within the bilateral distal PAs, and they extended into multiple lobar branches um, involving all lobes, and it was completely obstructive in the left lung. These are two shots of his echo that was done almost immediately after, just showing an enlarged RV size with decreased function. So uh, weight-based heparin was initiated. However, the patient became increasingly hypoxic, requiring a non-rebreather to maintain oxygen saturation. Um, in discussion with the PERT team, due to the patient's worsening symptoms, increasing oxygen requirements, his RV dysfunction, and his recent bilateral lung transplant, uh, we deemed invasive intervention was deemed necessary. Um, and so the decision was made to perform a mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, so we accessed the right femoral vein uh, with a 24 French gore dry seal sheath. Um, and using a seven French balloon wedge catheter, we did um, some baseline hemodynamics. So it was pre-procedure pulmonary artery mean pressure was 45. Um, next, we uh, did a pulmonary artery angiogram with an MP catheter um, with side holes. So on the left, you can see um, basically a pre-procedural imaging um, demonstrating filling defects um, or thrombi in the left distal PA um, with really poor distal flow. Uh, so then we went ahead and used a 20 French flow retriever catheter. Uh, it was advanced into the left PA and uh, three runs of mechanical thrombectomy were performed. And on the right, you can see um, our repeat pulmonary angiogram demonstrating no significant residual thrombus burden. On to the right side. Um, on the left is again a pulmonary artery angiogram with MP catheter. Um, there's filling defects uh, or thrombi in the right distal PA with really bad poor distal flow. Um, and so we advanced the catheter to the right um, pulmonary artery and uh, two or three runs of mechanical thrombectomy were performed there. I mean, on the right, you can see a post-procedure angiogram through that catheter demonstrating um, significant, uh, no significant residual thrombus burden and uh, much improved distal flow. Uh, so this picture here is the amount of thrombi we uh, recovered bilaterally. We did a post-intervention hemodynamics, which showed a a significant improvement in mean PA from 45 to 22. Um, there were no immediate complications. Uh, following the procedure, the patient's oxygen saturations improved and the next day he didn't require any supplemental oxygen. Uh, he was transitioned to therapeutic low molecular weight-based heparin for long-term anticoagulation um, and was discharged home within a week. Uh, one month following treatment, the patient was seen in our clinic and his functional status had greatly improved and he'd been tolerating his anticoagulation without any issues. Uh, so as we know, uh, pulmonary embolism is a known risk of major surgery and has been shown to be more frequent complication of post-lung transplants compared to other surgeries. Um, the pathophysiology of this association hasn't exactly been elucidated. However, its effects on lung transfer recipients can be far more catastrophic due to the absence of collateral bronchial circulation. So not surprisingly, the risk of pulmonary infarction is at its highest immediately following the transplant. Over time, the collateral bronchial circulation can redevelop, but it may not be as robust as the general population. So these patients are still considered high-risk individuals for PE complications. 
Uh, so there's multiple treatment options for some massive PEs, as we already heard about one earlier, um, including systemic anticoagulation, which this patient um, did not do well on, uh, systemic or catheter-directed lytics, mechanical aspiration, which we did here, or surgical embolectomy. Um, each have different risks, include bleeding or surgical complications. Um, systemic thrombolysis can result in fast improvement in lung perfusion, but is associated with a significantly increased risk of bleeding, especially in the early post-op period. Uh, Catheter-directed lytics is also an attractive alternative um, that's been used in transplant patients, as we've heard, um, but, you know, requires an intensive care stay during the infusion and still has some bleeding risk. Um, here, the patient was clinically deteriorating despite systemic anticoagulation, and based on our recent transplant, we a very high risk for thrombolytics or surgical embolectomy. So here, we were able to demonstrate that uh, large bore catheter manipulation and advancement past recent surgical suture lines can be safely performed with an aspiration catheter. Um, and it, the procedure was safe and effectively performed, and he was stabilized immediately following the procedure. Um, so compared to lytics, we think that percutaneous thrombectomy has an advantage of avoiding risks of bleeding, avoiding a stay in the ICU, and potentially leading to an early discharge, given the immediate improvement of symptoms and hemodynamics. That's uh, fantastic. Dr. Rods, what happened to the patient? Did you say that, you know, what, what came out of the patient? What did you mention that? Maybe I missed it. Yeah, he did, really, he did really well. Um, he was weaned off oxygen the next day and he went home within a week. Okay, great. Uh, Lena, what actually was evacuated? Can, did you have a... She showed the picture, she showed the picture. Okay. You know, I, I okay, perfect. I actually missed that part. What I'm saying is that I think in the chat room, I think both Thomas Stu, Sartaj Gale, and Bo Hawkins raised this excellent point you mentioned regarding specifics about lung transplant patients and the lack of laterals, which specifically is an anatomic risk that one should be aware of. I think both presentations. So Mehdi, take it away, please. But I really, really love those two cases. Right. No, I, I, I think that the, I think what we do is that we have uh, three experts. You know, why don't we let them comment? You know, what did they, what do they pick up from these two cases, and what's the teaching point? I guess we do cases to learn from them. So Jay, maybe we can start from you, and we go down to Chris, and then June at the bottom. At least on my screen, I start from top to bottom. Yeah, I'll start by saying, and uh, I'm sorry, I just mentioned the chat box, but to say it out loud, it's actually quite unusual or somewhat unusual to decompensate. Uh, overall, the intermediate risk or intermediate dash high risk population, as was mentioned, with PE on anticoagulation alone. In PIPO, the largest uh, random perspective randomized trial of PE uh, of 500 patients, the anticoagulation alone arm, uh, 25, so 5% of them decompensated uh, with that therapeutic strategy in relatively expert centers in Europe who probably had them well anticoagulated. The vast majority of those patients uh, were rescued without suffering mortality. Um, so only nine of those uh, 25 patients actually uh, ended up dying. Um, so um, it, that, that, that in itself is a bit of an unusual uh, scenario, and uh, especially when you've used low molecular weight heparin. In our practice, uh, we've seen decompensation more likely to happen in folks who are, uh, are subtherapeutic on anticoagulation. Uh, and that has been shown in observational data in the past, that time to therapeutic anticoagulation is a major driver of decompensation in this uh, group. Uh, especially patients who don't make it to therapeutic anticoagulation status within 24 hours, which if you actually do quality improvement uh, studies in your institution, you probably will find is shockingly common if you're using unfractionated heparin. That's what we found. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying that uh, although the first instinct is to say uh, what was going on in this intermediate high-risk patient, especially in an era of more aggressive therapies for PE, treating them at anticoagulation alone, uh, I don't think, I, I think the initial step uh, is, was, was very reasonable. Uh, obviously, I think there were options for uh, further management after there's some decompensation indicated. My talk, will get into that. Yeah, I, I think one, one thing I would say, if I may, you know, before we go to Chris, is that, you know, the, the challenge I, that I find is that, you know, when we quote studies like PITHO, this patient would have never made it to that trial. That know, is exactly right. Transplant. So, and we are seeing people that are much sicker, cancer patients, stage four cancer, you know, uh, that are now lung being transplant patient, lung transplant patients. I think these are a little different. Right. So I think that, you know, also so that 
percentage of people that they compensate, I think it's kind of a little bit, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the uh, population assessment of that depends on the kind of the, the, the baseline of the patients, meaning that, you know, I mean, we're getting PERT activation now on the kind of patients that actually will normally, will not be, I mean, Pytho patients, a lot of them actually don't get PERT activation. And, you know, we're getting PERT activation people with a stage four cancer and post lung transplant and COVID and all kinds of things that we really don't have a lot of data on and we don't know how they, how they're going to, you know, evolve and be learning more. But those are great points, Jay. Thank you. Uh, Chris, your take? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Jay. I'm a little bit surprised he decompensated further, this patient. I mean, there was minimal residual thrombus in the leg. But I'll tell you, in my institution, we would have been a little more aggressive. You know, he was a moderate to high-risk presentation, um, you know, presented with syncope. We have a very low risk option for treatment, which is mechanical thrombectomy. I was a little bit confused on why the bailout in a guy like this was systemic lytics. Um, you know, I thought the management up front was appropriate. Okay. So he's borderline. Let's give him anticoagulation and see how he does. But then the next morning, he's still tachypnic and still hypoxic. My approach would have been mechanical thrombectomy um, at that point. Um, I'm, I'm not sure systemic lytics would have been my choice. Some, some people get low dose lytics, but I'm not sure systemic lytics was the bailout here. And the one other point that I like to make and is the, that the ultrasound, you know, the pelvic DV clots can be missed about 15 to 20% of the time. So even though you may not see clot in the SF, you know, in the femoral vein and, you know, maybe even iliacs or part of the iliacs, it's not, you know, you know, so uh, that, that's also something to keep in mind, you know, that, you know, this, you know, that we are not, you know, we could miss, you know, clot, you know, 15, 20% of the time in the deep pelvic uh, veins. Uh, June? So I, I tell all the other uh, commentators' uh, um, uh, thoughts here so far. I think with the first case, um, you know, I think he was probably a little sicker than uh, he looked on paper. Um, a lot of times you actually have to look at these PE patients yourself and kind of get a gestalt. Um, it's kind of passing the eyeball test, if you will. Um, if they're kind of borderline, if they're really having a lot of conversational dyspnea and they can't even finish one full sentence without taking a deep breath in, I oftentimes think these patients need a little bit of, uh, a little bit of help in terms of catheter-directed therapies. Um, so that's one uh, very important lesson, I think, from the first case. Uh, and then especially when he started to look a little bit worse on the second day, maybe that uh, should have been, uh, you know, we, we addressed whether or not he would have been a candidate at that point. Um, and then the second case, I think the important uh, learning point, uh, you know, you guys did a fantastic job. Uh, for those fellows coming out into practice, you know, I probably wouldn't choose a lung, fresh lung transplant as my first Inari case. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, you have to be very careful. That's a huge catheter to uh, push into a fresh lung. Uh, so very experienced operators have to be present uh, for cases like that. But amazing result. Maybe you want to say that both winners actually get $500 from CVI. So yeah. I thought uh, I was going to get that money. You're going to give it to them? Come on, man. You know, yes, yes, you're so breaking you, the rules. No. To the three of them, actually, because yeah, of the that's right. presentation. So yeah. let's move on, Mehdi. Uh, this is no, fantastic. Okay. I they, really they, they, Absolutely, absolutely. We're going to move on. And, you know, this is, I already learned so much. It's incredible. But let's move to Dr. Hoff. And uh, the Chris is going to teach us about A to Z, the technical aspect of doing a percutaneous uh, uh, embolectomy. Yeah, thanks, Mehdi. Thanks for inviting me to speak at this webinar. So as Mehdi said, I'm going to talk about the technical aspects of pulmonary thrombectomy. These are my disclosures. So currently there are two main catheters that are used to perform pulmonary thrombectomy. One is the Inari flow retriever, and the other is the Indigo device by Penumbra, which has a 12 and an eight French catheter. Now due to time constraints, we're gonna focus on the Inari flow retriever and I'll walk you through in detail how I perform the procedure. For those who aren't familiar with the device, there's a 20 and a 24 French main catheter that's placed in the PA and mechanical thrombectomy is performed via this lower lock syringe. You can also place these nitinol discs through the catheter, which can be deployed in the PA and help remove more chronic thrombus from the arterial wall. So these are the steps I use for safe and effective thrombectomy. 
I think it all starts with pre-procedural planning. I review CT scans in detail and I formulate my plan of attack before going in. I know where I'm gonna park my wire, where I'm gonna park my, cat, park my catheter um, and how many pulls it's likely gonna take me on each side to get this caught out. If time allows, I love to see an echo pre-procedurally, not just to look at the RV, but to also look for caught in transit. If it's there, I'm gonna get it on my way in. And upfront venous duplex is helpful. It helps you decide which groin you're gonna access. If you see right femoral vein clot or common femoral vein clot, you're probably not gonna access that side. It also helps me determine whether or not at the end, I'm gonna leave behind a filter. If the patient's real sick and has a lot of residual thrombus, it's at least a consideration. So venous access is important. I think that uh, these days we should always be using ultrasound guided micropuncture access. Um, if there wasn't an ultrasound before the procedure, it's also your opportunity to see if there's clot in that groin before accessing it. Um, the worst thing you wanna do is hit the artery and then be dealing with the complications of uh, inadvertent arterial access uh, in a pretty sick PE patient. I make it a habit to always do an iliac angio through my sheath before I start. You never know what you might find. You can find significant clot that was not seen on ultrasound. You can find evidence of external compression. You can find an occluded iliac vein. I then pre-close my groin with one per close device. And after serial dilatation, I insert a 24 French core dry seal sheath. Now, this may be the most important part of the procedure for preventing mechanical complications in the heart. Take your time and float a balloon tipped catheter through that sheath and into the PA. This will avoid the tricuspid and the pulmonic apparatus. The last thing we wanna do is track a 24 French device underneath the tricuspid apparatus and risk damaging it. You can use a pigtail catheter for this, but you need to be extremely careful. If the pigtail catches at all, you should start over. I always obtain an opening PA pressure as well as a PA sat to get a baseline cardiac output. Once I've obtained that, I exchange my swan for a pigtail catheter and you can perform angiography in the main PA, but I prefer selective angiography in the right and left PA. I do 10 for 20 um, and I always start on the left side because I like to end my angiography on the right because that's the side I'm gonna treat first. Now, why treat the right first? Well, first of all, it's the easier side, of, side to treat. So it's kind of nice to start there. But second of all, the catheter naturally wants to flip over to the left. So when you finish treating the right, all you have to do is gently pull your catheter back and it will flip over to the left PA. It's much more difficult to go from left to right. So once I've completed my PA angiography with a pigtail, I exchange for an angulated catheter like a multipurpose or an Abbey cross. Now, when you're going to wire the pulmonary arteries, it's important to know your anatomy. Almost always, you're gonna place your wire in one of the basal branches in the right and left lung. And those are the lateral basal and the posterior basal branches. Why place it there? Well, number one, that's usually where the clot is starting before it extends back into the, into the main PA. But number two, these are big branches. It's a safe placement for your wire. Um, these vessels will cross the shadow of the diaphragm. So you know you've made it to the basal aspect of the lung if you see your wire cross the shadow of the diaphragm. The only other branch I sometimes access is the truncus because often there's clots sitting in this. And if it's large enough, you can get your catheter in there and get that thrombus out. So you can use different wires to monitor or to wire into these PA branches. Um, I prefer a 260 centimeter glide wire advantage and I track it with, through a multipurpose catheter. You have to be careful with hydrophilic tip wires. Certainly you can end up with perforation if you're too aggressive. I want something that's very torqueable and has a soft tip and I find this works its way through the clot very nicely. Don't be afraid to J the wire as it will avoid the small branches and it should take a nice straight path right to the shadow of the diaphragm. If it doesn't, then pull back and start over because that's where the wire should go. Once you've accessed your branch of choice, you just remove your glide wire advantage or whatever wire you've chosen and then you have to exchange for a stiff wire. The best wire I've found is the one centimeter soft tip Amplat super stiff wire and it parks in place distally very nicely and usually locks in place. You need to be very confident in your wire location before proceeding with thrombectomy. So here's an example where you can see the wire doesn't quite make it to the shadow of the diaphragm, but it looks to be in a decent place. But unfortunately, when aspirations perform, not much clot is retrieved from the left PA. And this tends to be more of a problem on the left. If you swing the camera then over RAO, 
you can see that this wire is in some tiny branch and the catheter is directed away from the clot. So almost always, if you're unsuccessful aspirating on the left, it's because you haven't positioned your wire appropriately. Now, what can also happen is the PA can be occluded. So you actually have no idea where your wire is going. I think if it tracks safely across the shadow of the diaphragm, you are most likely in one of those basal branches. This is an example where the wire didn't make it to the shadow of the diaphragm. The proximal PA was occluded, so you couldn't just take a picture through the, through the main anari catheter. So this is a small puff through the microcatheter or through the Navicross catheter. And you can see immediate filling of the pulmonary vein. You know you're in a small branch here. You need to come back. This is not where you want your wire. And once the wire was redirected across the shadow of the diaphragm and the catheter brought down and a puff given, you can see you're in the posterior basal branch and you're ready to go. Now, once you have your wire in place, it's important that when you track your retriever catheter in, it doesn't encounter resistance. It should glide right through the tricuspid valve and up into the RVOT. Occasionally, it can want a cobra uh, into the, the RV if it's really dilated, but the tip should not encounter resistance. If the tip is encountering resistance in the RVOT, have a very low resistance for taking everything out and refloating your swan safely through the tricuspid and pulmonic valves. The other thing I'll say when you're inserting your device, resist the urge to bury the catheter distally, especially in the left PA, because if you pack the clot down in the distal left PA, PA it can be very challenging to remove. Once the, once the catheter is in place and, you're, and it's time for aspiration, I think you, know, you should always start proximally and work distally. Uh, again, because the last thing you wanna do is pack that clot in. It can take an, a, a semi or uh, almost occluded left PA and make it occluded and the patient get much more ill. So start proximally, work distally. Um, I tend to advance the catheter just into the start of the clot and there's a valve on the back end of the catheter. If you open the valve and there's no bleeding, you wanna step it back until there's at least a trickle of blood from the valve. You need some blood flow into the tip of that catheter to bring the clot in. And then take your time aspirating, allow time for the clot to entrain in the catheter. I wait 45 seconds, I lock the, the lure lock, and I reset the syringe. I do that again. I never let go of that negative suction, allow plenty of time for that clot to be pulled into the catheter. And the other uh, piece of advice I'll give is reach for the discs early, particularly in the left PA. You can see here on this picture, the wire is well positioned in the lateral basal branch. It crosses well across the shadow of the diaphragm. But on the first aspiration, I didn't get clot. So what did I do? I deployed the discs. Let the disc sit for three minutes. That will allow clot to entrain within the disc. And then as you pull the disc back, do another aspiration. Sometimes you won't get a lot of clot out on the disc, but it, what it does, it will pull that clot up to the catheter. The aspiration following that usually will yield a large amount of clots. So when are you done? Well, first off, you're gonna repeat your angiogram. And the best way to do that is to load 10 cc's of contrast in the flow retriever catheter and then chase it with saline. That'll give you an excellent picture. And you wanna pay attention to perfusion, okay? You may see other areas of thrombus, but if the lung perfusion looks good, then you're probably done. And then you're gonna to wanna to recheck your PA pressure to ensure improvement and also recheck your PA sat to ensure you've improved the cardiac output. A word of advice, don't chase distal segmental or subsegmental thrombus, especially if your perfusion is normal. It will not affect clinical outcome. My exit strategy, I take everything out in the lab and then I cinch down the perclose and then I put a figure of eight stitch in the skin to provide further hemostasis. I never interrupt anticoagulation for the procedure. If they come in on a heparin infusion, they stay on it throughout the procedure and I leave them on it overnight. The next day I will transition them to DOAC and then they usually follow up in my office with an echocardiogram in one month to reassess recovery of the RV. So I'll do a real quick case. This was a 72 year old gentleman with hypertension and disc disease. He underwent routine spinal decompression surgery. They left a drain in place. The following morning, he got up to ambulate with PT and he syncopized. They put him back in bed, chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotensive, satting 80%. He was placed on an honorary breather and started on Levofed and he was sent for an emergent CTA which showed significant bilateral pulmonary emboli and a dilated RV, big surprise. The neurosurgeon Dale and Institution cleared him for heparin and then he was accepted by life flight over to my cath lab. You can see on the angiogram, he has a large pulmonary emboli draped up into the truncus and down into the right inner lower branch. 
We wired clearly out into the lateral um, basal branch. You can see the wires in good place. Aspiration, we removed almost all of the thrombus. Yes, there's some small areas of decreased perfusion, but there's nothing there to chase after. You're done on this side. On the left, the PA is virtually occluded, so it's hard to know where you're sending your wire, but if you send it distal, then you can take a picture with your catheter, as I showed earlier, and you know you're here, you're in the posterior basal branch. At this point, you can deploy your wire and you're ready to work. We didn't get anything on the first pull, so we deployed the discs, let them dwell for three minutes, then we did an aspiration. We, we filled the catheter up with thrombus and had to remove the, the catheter from the body. So we just went back up with a pigtail to get our final PA pressure sat into a final angiogram. And you can see there's absolutely normal lung perfusion at this point. There's the clot that was removed. It looks very acute. And so his clinical course followed what we see uh, with improvement um, by catheter thrombectomy. He would, norepinephrine was discontinued in the lab. He went to the floor. He never went to the ICU. And echocardiogram the next morning showed normal RV function. He, he stayed in the hospital for about three days because of the spinal drain, but he was ultimately discharged home on Eliquis and has done well since that time. Thank you. Awesome. Great, Chris. Chris, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Very technical and step-by-step. -step. You know, for the sake of time, let's move on to uh, Dr. Guri and uh, let's do the presentations and then we spend the rest of the time, you know, where, you know we can go obviously 10, 15 minutes past the hour. We so uh, with this, Dr. Guri, I'm going to hand it to you. You're going to talk about paradigm shift in the treatment of massive PE, not submassive, but massive PE. Let's talk about massive PE. And when we're talking about massive PE, we obviously mean pulmonary embolism associated with hemodynamic compromise, meaning uh, blood pressure, systolic, less than 90 millimeters mercury, or those requiring pressors, or in the worst cases, what I call catastrophic PE, those patients who are actually sustaining cardiac arrest. There's another subset of patients that's a smaller group, those patients with overwhelming hypoxia that I think uh, that is really not responsive to oxygenation, that they can also be considered in this group. Um, overall, massive P treatment paradigms, I would argue, don't work. This is a, an insubmission uh, meta-analysis uh, from a group that I'm a part of that is showing uh, in published literature 22.5% in-hospital mortality with current approaches you know, over the past decade or so. Uh, what are those current approaches? Well, a surprising amount of these patients are treated conservatively uh, with anticoagulation, uh, and it may be due to other comorbid comorbidities and things, but many of them are also treated with systemic lytics. Uh, and systemic lytics have failure of efficacy in this group, uh, as we're seeing in real world practice, but they also have significant safety harms. This from a meta-analysis from my research group from several years ago, we looked at uh, systemic lytics versus anticoagulation, all the randomized trials that have ever been performed. And if you look at the major bleeding rates with systemic lytics, they were quite high at 9%. And if you look at the intracranial hemorrhage rates, they were 1.5%. So very non-trivial. And that's consistent with that seen in observational data regarding systemic lice as well. Always 1.5 to 2% rates of intracranial hemorrhage. So in real world data, that can even approach 3%. The other thing to keep in mind, uh, although systemic lysis uh, gets recommended in guidelines for patients with massive P, sometimes even with class kind of level 2A guidelines or even level 1 guidelines with, uh, uh, you know, evidence level C uh, or, you know, based on consensus recommendations, but not a lot of data. The only data that exists that's randomized is this study. And the important thing to know about this one study of random of, uh, of uh, systemic lytics for anticoagulation and massive PE is that there were eight patients randomized. Uh, that's all you really need to know. We don't know much from, from randomized data. Uh, that's why I argue that we're not gonna have randomized data to guide us here, but we have to realize that we're in a different era than when uh, these, uh, certainly when that study was performed, which was over 30 years ago, and, uh, and also uh, a different era than when much of this evidence base and, uh, has been derived and these guidelines are based upon. Uh, and my argument is that there's a very high mortality for systemic lice. I mentioned the, uh, I mean, for uh, uh, massive P, I mentioned the in-hospital mortality. This is a 30-day mortality. And for that reason, we may want to take a very different approach than what has been done. And this will be in contrast to what I mentioned, the intermediate risk group, which I kind of alluded to, uh, despite the one case that we saw, is much more likely to be stable initially and, and for you to make kind of more nuanced decisions. So the first question I ask myself is, should I institute emergent mechanical circulatory support? And of course, everybody doesn't have this available to them in the modern era. We'll talk a little bit about what this means. 
And what are the questions that I ask to, to whether that answer is yes? The first is I wanna make sure the patient has no life-threatening comorbidities. And that really means to me, life expectancy less than one year. In many cases, that could mean kind of stage four cancer, although you'd be surprised how many stage four cancers are actually well-treated these days with how fast oncology is evolving. Reasonable age, we usually use 80 as a cutoff in our hospital, although to be honest, I've treated up to 86 in this, uh, in this kind of clinical scenario, but 80 is our rule of thumb. Uh, and then I do look not just for the fact that they're hypotensive, but they, the pressors are actually escalating. So usually my threshold is if we're reaching for the second presser, I'd prefer that we're reaching for the mechanical circuitry support. Uh, there are patients you'll see who are stable on one or two or four of epi. And those are patients who you certainly want to make aggressive decisions on, but you may not need mechanical circuitry support to get to those decisions. The other group, of course, is those patients who are suffering an in-hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, if you have the ability to get to them fast uh, and keep them going while you can get them on support, these are rescuable patients uh, because they have an easily correctable reason for their arrest. Uh, the most common form of support that's used nationally, and this is what we use in our center, is, is ECMO. Um, ECMO is generally placed percutaneously, fem-fem, with large cannula in the artery and the vein uh, in the femoral. And, uh, and then we, have, uh, we take over, uh, obviously, the circulatory support for the patient uh, and also have an oxygenator. So oxygenation is now no longer a problem either. Um, we looked at this with uh, data from MGH just led by my uh, colleague, Ido Weinberg. And um, back before they had ECMO availability from 1994 to 2006, in this group of patients who was on multiple pressors or had cardiac arrest, they had a 17% in hospital survival. Uh, after, during the ECMO era, that rose to about 41%. So of course, this is not perfect apples to apples comparisons, but this just showed that it seemed like things were getting better when ECMO was made available. Uh, of course, everybody doesn't have ECMO available and where this field could be going is towards isolated right ventricular assist devices for some of these patients. This is not gonna be able to be placed at the bedside. It's gonna have to be placed uh, in cath labs uh, with emergent activation. So it won't necessarily be right for everybody like those coding patients, but there'll be a fair number of patients you may be able to treat with this. Um, the two uh, kind of uh, devices that are out there now for this are called the Protec Duo uh, from Tandem Life and then the Impella RP from Abiomed. Uh, my friend Mahir Elder from Detroit Medical Center has been doing this because he doesn't have easy, ready access to ECMO at that center. Uh, and in, in his first five uh, massive PE patients, we treated with a combination of, uh, as you can see here, Impella RP, uh, which is taking blood out of the RA, putting it back into the left PA, so bypassing the right ventricle, which is failing. Um, he then uh, added catheter-directed lysis patients, and he did have five out of five survival for what it's worth. So we consider mechanical circuitry support, no matter how you cut it, in our case, ECMO, in his case, right ventricular support, uh, as a bridge to definitive therapy, which can be catheter-directed lysis, large bore embolectomy, as was mentioned by Chris, um, smaller bore embolectomy devices, sometimes surgical embolectomy, or believe it or not, anticoagulation alone for several days, four days, five days of anticoagulation to allow that to kick in and allow the RV to kind of come back to life to allow for decannulation. Uh, that's becoming less common these days given the evolution of technologies we have in the lungs, but still is an option in rare cases. Uh, your options for catheter-directed lysis include these three catheters, uh, Craig McNamara and Unifuse catheters, which are simple catheters, just have side holes, there's pieces of plastic with side holes, and the Ecos catheter, which I think June's going to speak more closely about, which is a little bit more complex uh, that involves ultrasound assistance to uh, theoretically fragment the clot a little bit uh, as the uh, lytics are being given. Uh, there are uh, bleeding rates associated with uh, catheter-erected lysis. Uh, the major bleeding rates uh, in a meta-analysis of five prospective studies of this, we identified as about 4%. And the intracranial hemorrhage rates we identified as 0.7%. The upper end of those confidence intervals is about 1.3%, not far off that 1.5% I mentioned with systemic lytics. So the jury is still out on whether catheterectolysis is truly safer than systemic lytics because there haven't been true apples to apples comparisons. However, the data that's out there right now is suggestive that it is, that it seems like it's a safer therapy than systemic lytics based on this. This is the best available data I'm showing you here. And it looks better than that similar observational data and randomized trial data in systemic lytics. Uh, we mentioned, uh, Chris mentioned Flotriever in depth, so I won't have to delve into it, but obviously a great choice in many of these patients. 
Uh, and the other uh, device that's out there is a smaller boron black community device, although it's getting larger, now 12 French, the Indigo device, uh, which is a, a mechanized aspiration device. Uh, when you're weighing lytics versus embolectomy as an adjunct to your, um, to your uh, mechanical support or in those patients who may not quite need it yet, uh, keep in mind that lytics are associated with increased major bleeding and increased, increased intracranial hemorrhage. It really doesn't happen with embolectomy at all. Um, however, embolectomy is associated with a significant learning curve. As uh, Chris mentioned, there's some technical nuances to this that you really want to get the hang of. Uh, and there is, uh, you know, reports of precipitating decompensation in these patients. It's a large bore device. Uh, and you can imagine pulmonary injury or other issues uh, being a risk. However, I will mention that also seems to be wrapped up into the learning curve issues with uh, expert operators that are now being reported in ongoing registries seeming to be having less issues with this. Uh, finally, uh, you know, the question will always come up, um, how about giving uh, lytics and then if it's not working, crashing the patient onto ECMO? Uh, we have found, uh, systemic lytics uh, in this type of group. We have found this to be, uh, you know, not the greatest strategy in, in our practice uh, because of the uh, difficulty of putting a patient who has fresh lytics, oftentimes maybe even kind of peri-arrest uh, in percutaneous access at the bedside with flawed board cannula. We've seen significant bleeding complications and also uh, uh, bleeding complications within the intra-abdominal uh, vasculature sometimes with the strategy. Uh, so we worry about it. We think stabilizing them with mechanical support, if it's possible, is a superior strategy. Um, as far as this um, uh, one observational study from uh, folks at Kentucky, they noticed that all five patients in their observational cohort of those receiving systemic thrombolytics prior to ECMO died, despite what they tried to do afterwards. The last group I'll mention, which I've alluded to uh, a few times, is that group of patients who I call stable massive. I'm not actually putting them on ECMO uh, because they don't quite need it. They're hanging in there with blood pressures that are flirting around 90 millimeters of mercury with fluid resuscitation, or I've got them on a single presser, but it's not rapidly escalating. But I still have to make quick decisions in them. And what I do is take those patients to the cath lab where I can make those decisions. I will, act, I will let my perfusion team know, so I have the mechanical support on standby. I'll put a four French arterial line in their, in their left femoral artery. Uh, and then I'll start doing my work oftentimes via the right femoral vein, um, uh, which could be uh, oftentimes either embolectomy uh, with flow retriever or placement of a couple of catheter-directed catheters, either through that vein or through anticubital uh, veins. Uh, so you can choose between those uh, options oftentimes based on your experiences and, uh, and availability. Uh, so that would be my take in my opinion on the most modern approach to massive PE understanding the logistical barriers that are sometimes present right now, but I'm hoping we can all try to move towards this where we wanna uh, kind of cut down on this preventable cause of death. Awesome, excellent talk, Jay. Jay, as usual, you know, excellent and, you know, very informative, very data-driven and, uh, you know, we really appreciate you being here with us uh, tonight. It's just incredible uh, how much we are learning from this disease that we used to just give anti you know, great. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I can't believe that. Right. Yeah. Honestly, when I was training, somebody told me there's this much into PE, I would be like, you're crazy, man. You're, you're, you know, you know, there's no way, you know, it's incredible. June, uh, we saved the best for last, you know, so uh, tell us about pharmacomechanical mechanical license. And I know you have done all of the things that was shown tonight. You have done it, you know, ECMO, this, somehow June attracts all the patients that crash and you urge an ECMO, but <laughs> Anyway, tell us about the pharmacomechanical. All right, so here's the, my slide. So I'm gonna start with a case presentation. This was actually early in our PERT uh, experience. So this was actually several years ago. Um, you know, we've learned a lot as a PERT team. Uh, our algorithm has actually changed uh, a little bit since this case. So, you know, some of the things that we had done previously, we don't necessarily do anymore. Um, so this was a 61-year-old gentleman with a history of DVT PE about four years ago prior to his presentation. He had eight months of Coumadin and uh, he was uh, stopped. Uh, he then presented to us with a submassive PE and DVT. As you can see here, his heart rate uh, was a little bit elevated. His blood pressure was kind of borderline. His saturation was still mid-90s on room air. On exam, he did have a little bit of conversational dyspnea. Troponin was mildly elevated. His lactate was fine. His BNP was a little bit elevated as well. Based on his PESI score, he was intermediate risk. So again, this was early in our experience. 
Um, so you know, I, I don't have the CT scan uploaded here, but you can see the echo, the RV is huge. Um, the the uh, LV septum is completely flattened. Um, at this time, the decision was made with the pulmonologist that we were going to medically manage and reevaluate in three days. So again, um, I think this would have been a very different conversation in, in 2021. The TTE was unchanged at the third day, so we ended up taking the patient to uh, ECOS. So just a few comments kind of technically, um, because this was not intended to be a technical talk uh, specifically about ECOS. Um, what we typically do is get groin access. I usually do two six front sheets, both in the right femoral vein, um, ass assuming that there's no thrombus sitting in the right side. Um, and then you sequentially wire each uh, uh, left and right pulmonary artery. Uh, I typically actually traverse uh, into the PA using a JR4 uh, diagnostic catheter with a VersaCore wire or a Woolly wire. Um, I, t I don't actually use Clyde wires, uh, and this will be a little bit contrast to Dr. Huff's practice, um, just because I have seen pulmonary artery uh, perforations with Clyde wires. Um, so especially if we're going to be administering TPA, I tend to only use a uh, versical or ver uh, woolly wire. And what you want to do is kind of part these in the bilateral um, uh, pulmonary arteries and try to have them transect uh, more in the main PA so that you kind of drip um, TPA distally as well. Um, in this particular patient, we utilized a protocol that was one milligram per hour of TPA per catheter uh, for six hours and then decreased to half a milligram per hour per catheter. Uh, at the same time, there's coolant uh, cooling down each catheter. So there's going to be a drug port and a coolant port. Um, there's heparin going through the uh, sheath um, in the groin. Uh, so that there's a little bit of low-dose low heparin uh, uh, infusing into the patient's body as well. So here you can see uh, this is 24 hours post. This is after the catheters are already removed. The RV is uh, significantly improved in size. Um, it's not yet normal, but it's dramatically improved. It's probably closer to a one-to-one -one ratio at this point, and the function has improved as well. Clinically, this patient did great. Uh, he was discharged uh, two days after um, our initial egos uh, and did well uh, subsequently on long-term uh, anticoagulants. This is a demonstration of what ECOS looks like when it's um, on inside the body. Here you can see these beads are exactly where the ultrasound uh, is um, coming. Uh, there's also uh, infusion ports right at the beads so that not only is it uh, 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 actively lysing with TPA. It's also uh, kind of uh, busting up the clot with the ultrasounds. So theoretically, there's three mechanisms of how it delivers uh, superior uh, uh, mechanism compared to just conventional uh, catheter-directed uh, thrombolysis. So first, uh, theoretically, the ultrasound unwinds fibrin without fragmentation of emboli. Here you can see on the left panel, fibrin without ultrasound and then versus fibrin, fibrin with ultrasound, and it helps decrease the size of the fibrin molecules. Um, there's active drug delivery. So theoretically, with the acoustic streaming that you saw on the prior slide, the ultrasound actually drives the drug deeper into the clot. Um, and then uh, the third potential uh, mechanism is that there's a reperfusion benefit because it induces the endothelium to release nitric oxide uh, so such that it re, uh, relaxes the arteries and uh, creates more perfusion. Multiple studies have come out of the um, uh, Boston Scientific uh, ECOS cohort. So if the very first one was the Ultima, which proved uh, was the first study, which proved reduction in RV versus uh, uh, or RV or LV ratio versus anticoagulation alone. So this was the randomized control trial. Secondly, Seattle study published in 2015 um, used these more standardized protocol that was then promoted. Um, and these patients were treated for massive PEs as well. Uh, more recently in the last couple of years, Optolyse uh, PE was published uh, looking at shorter durations of TPA infusion. Uh, and one of the criticisms, and here I'm going to point out the duration of each treatment therapy. Um, one of the criticisms of Seattle and Ultima is that is how long the patients were treated for. 
So here you can see in Ultima, in the original trial, the patients were treated at one milligram per hour for five hours, and then half a milligram per hour for 10 hours, uh, which led to a total of 10 milligrams over 15 hours per lung. Um, in the Seattle trial, they utilized one milligram per hour for 24 hours for a unilateral clot, uh, one milligram per hour for 12 hours per side for bilateral clots, so a total of 24 uh, milligrams of TPA total. So keep that in mind as we're going to actually go through the alkalize uh, cohorts as well. These, uh, obviously this uh, study is relatively small, so there's only about 27 patients in each arm if you will. Um, so we, ha we have to keep that in mind. Uh, these were patients with acute PEDVT that had a large uh, RV to LV ratio. Their primary endpoint was looking at the efficacy and the change in the RV to LV ratio on CT scan based at 48 hours, as well as safety outcomes. So here I wanted to point out the first cohort, the ARM1, um, the, these patients received a total of either four or eight milligrams of TPA over the course of two hours. Um, and four or eight is dependent on single versus double lungs. So whether or not it's unilateral or bilateral PEs. Uh, so that led to two milligrams per hour per catheter. So this is then higher than both doses used in uh, Ultima and, um, and uh, in um, the second study, uh, Seattle. So the second cohort that they had, uh, ARM2, was one milligram per hour per catheter over four hours. So there's a difference in terms of the hours that we're uh, infusing as well. ARM3 uh, was one milligram per hour per catheter over six hours. So here you can see between uh, ARM1 and ARM2, there's four and eight total um, versus cohort uh, three or ARM3, that's six and 12 milligrams total of TPA. And then finally, core four had the largest uh, uh, duration as well as dose of TPA uh, transfused. Uh, so it's a total of two milligrams per hour per catheter uh, for a total of 12 or 24 milligrams of TPA. So keeping uh, those uh, values in mind, then if we look at uh, ARM 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, when they look at the modified Miller score, uh, which is essentially a score to decipher how well perfused is the lung uh, segmental arteries after lysis. Um, so if you can look at the, uh, if we look at the cheated uh, per protocol population here on the bottom, the percentage change in cohort uh, ARM1, uh, it was minus 6%. Uh, and as you increase in the duration and the dosing of TPA, obviously that score uh, got better. So then such that you actually achieved more lysis, the longer or the more uh, TPA you infuse, which makes sense. Interestingly enough, despite uh, the finding on CTA, clinically, when they look at the RV to LV ratio, which is their primary outcome for the study, um, equivalently across the board, all of these patients had reduced RV to LV ratio um, at the 40 hour mark, regardless of which arm they were in. So, despite treating patients only for two hours at the lower dose in ARM1, you achieve the same RV to LV ratio uh, benefit. When they look at the safety outcomes, um, interestingly enough, there were uh, actually zero bleeds in ARM1, so the lowest dose of TPA. ARM2, uh, ARM 3, and 4 all had uh, patients that had bleeding. Um, interestingly enough, in ARM2 and 3, uh, two of the bleeds were actually associated with off-protocol additional TPA being given after the, the um, initial uh, ECO uh, protocol was com already completed. So these patients actually, they were thought to have additional uh, pulmonary embolus and they were given systemic TPA following the initial protocol. Um, there was one fatal intracranial hemorrhage per protocol, so according to the ECOS protocol, in ARM4. So this is a very interesting um, finding if you kind of dive a little bit more into the details of the trial. So overall, there may be no further benefit in patients receiving two milligrams per hour per catheter over six hours, but in fact, perhaps a little bit more harm because there was actually a little bit more bleeding. And Jay referred to this uh, already, so I'm not going to belabor it too much. 
Um, but when we look at the contemporary trials of all catheter directed lysis, this is ECOS as well as uh, conventional catheter directed thrombolysis. Um, there's a weighted aggregate of non intracranial major bleeding of 4.5% and an uh, intracranial hemorrhage of 0.7%. Comparatively speaking, if you look at the historical data, when people receive systemic TPA, um, the major bleeding, non intracranial and major bleeding, is 9.2%. So essentially, you have, if, if you compare kind of uh, maybe apples to uh, tangerines, um, not really apples to apples, but because this is historical comparison, so patients are very different. Um, there may be a decrease in half uh, in terms of major bleeding, um, non intracranial, as well as intracranial hemorrhage. Other considerations with ECOs, so obviously there's procedurally related complications. There may be perforation, as I mentioned, uh, rupture. Um, if you look at PA catheter-associated hemorrhage, it's only about 0.03%. This is in patients getting right heart cath. Generally, it's a very rare occurrence, but it does happen. Obviously, infarcted lungs may be more friable than the normal lung that you're doing a right heart cath. And so these patients may be a little bit more prone to having uh, perforations or ruptures. Um, so you have to be very careful when you do these types of procedures. The efficacy of ultrasound-assisted catheter-directed thrombolysis versus conventional thrombolysis um, using catheters in PE patients remains highly debated. Um, a very small, retro, very small retrospective studies have previously suggested there's no difference in overall outcomes, but these studies were very limited uh, they were non-randomized, very long enrollment periods, and long follow-up uh, time in, in terms of ascertainment bias. So I don't know that we can definitively say that ultrasound-assisted uh, catheter-directed therapies are the same as conventional. Um, theoretically, there's benefits to using the ultrasound um, to uh, help lyse the clots, but yet we don't have randomized control trials to prove this. Other uh, clinical decision-making um, should also encompass, uh, for example, patients with more absolute or relative contraindications for TPA, individualized hemodynamics to determine if intermediate, uh, sorry, immediate extraction is necessary. Uh, the catheter-directed thrombolysis requires at least several hours for effect. And then obviously your ICU length of stay time for longer infusion uh, periods of uh, which is why a shorter infusion period is sometimes attractive in these patients. So in conclusion, the use of uh, localized uh, ultrasound-assisted catheter-directed thrombolysis may improve modified Miller score and the RV to LV ratio more effectively compared to heparin anticoagulation alone. Uh, we shortened the duration of the ultrasound-assisted um, therapies uh, in an effort to minimize the bleeding risk as much as possible. Um, clinical decision-making should ultimately be balanced against the overall bleeding risk and potential need for urgent or emergent thrombus removal. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Jun, and, uh, you know, if you, there you go. Uh, you know, maybe I, if Subhash, if it's okay, you know, maybe I, I think we have a few minutes. It's uh, 10 or 7. I think we go to 10, 15. So let's do eight minutes of good intensive discussion to learn a little bit. One of the you know, decisions in deciding, you know, once you have decided, okay, I'm going to treat. And you're trying to decide between mechanical versus, uh, you know, embolectomy versus lysis is duration of uh, uh, um, time to success uh, from a standpoint of how sick the patient is. Does that play a role? Meaning that if you're going to do a pharmacomechanical lysis, you drip in one milligram or two milligram per hour, you need time for that to work. Versus if you're going with a, you know, in RE device, you're going to get an immediate, like, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you're going to be there, you're going to remove the clot. Does that ever play a role in your decision making? I don't know, Jay, you're unmuted, so you go first. <laughs> I, I would say that, uh, you know, there's uh, two categories. Um, uh, in the vast majority of patients that with P are coming in, and even the ones who are being treated now are still in that intermediate or intermediate high risk category, but not truly hypotensive, not on pressors. And those patients, uh, despite I know the results of that first case, as I kind of alluded to, I think you do have time in the majority of those patients. Uh, you are running some anticoagulant concomitantly with your, um, with your lytic going in. Uh, so that is, that's not the major driving factor in that intermediate risk population 
when I when I personally am making the decision. But I but uh, I think that could be different if you're uh, if you're looking at somebody who's on a presser, seeing a presser escalating, and you're reaching for support. I think the point you bring up is really good, and somebody who's on the sicker side. Now, uh, maybe can I ask Chris one quick question? Chris, have you used the Jindo wire supported with Navicross whenever uh, you don't see the distal vessels opacified, especially the posterior basal? You know, this is a 035, very supportive wire with an 014 tip and, and actually folds very well. And unlike the, uh, the Advantage Glide, which is hydrophilic, like June mentioned, can be, you know, if you have to be sufficiently experienced to use it, that might be a choice. The other question I have is that when do you actually, this is a fairly basic question, when do you choose to perform a PA angiogram versus you don't? I think that's a, a good question for folks because uh, to know. And the second question for you is that have you used intermediate level devices like the new 12 French Lightning, the intelligent aspiration, so that they call intelligent aspiration. And the second is the Bashir catheter that I've seen few case reports. So three questions for you. Uh, in quick rapid fire, please. Sure. Uh, no, I, I I tend to always. So the difference between the using the ecos, I agree on ecos. I never use a glide wire. I don't do ecos anymore. But you don't have to get very distal with the catheters. The distance when you're doing flow retriever with the 24 French devices, you need a fair amount of support. And if you're going to use the discs, you need room to deploy the disc. Actually, I never use a stiff angled glide wire. Just a glide wire advantage. It's a very soft tip, and I tend to always J it. And when you J it, you're actually very safe. You're going to miss all of these small branches. And if you watch it cross the shadow of the diaphragm, you're going to be in a great location every time. What happens is people take these sharp turns before they ever get to the diaphragm and they think, oh, it's okay there. I'll just put my amplats wire there. I think the amplats wire is way more likely to cause perforation if it's in the wrong spot, particularly if it comes back and then someone tries to re advance it, you know, without taking the time to rewire into a safe branch. Um, so I've, I don't, that's the wire I always use. Um, in terms of doing an angiogram, in someone who's ex really sick and just had a CT scan, there are times where I'll go right up and do an aspiration before ever taking a picture. And I'm usually going to go up and do that on the right side. It's usually the catheter is directed right into the thrombus where it's draped into the truncus and in the interlober. And almost always you'll grab caught on that first pull and their hemodynamics will improve dramatically. What I do more often is take a pigtail picture on the right and then aspirate on the right and then do a left pulmonary angiogram with my flow retriever catheter rather than doing two pictures up front. Um, and then the last thing, yes, I've used the Lightning 12 catheter. Um, it works well. There are two things. Number one is I don't think it's as effective when the clot, when the clot is more chronic. Remember the, the uh, aspiration velocity through this 24 French sheath by Inari is 165 cc's per second. The, the lightning catheter pales in comparison. So it's, it's relying on the pump. Now, if it's more chronic, you can use that separator, but it's still hard to get that clot to pass into the catheter. So if it's more chronic or I think it's subacute, I won't use it. And to be honest, I've seen colleagues cause more problems with that catheter because they don't understand the anatomy. Remember, you have to pull the wire out to treat with that catheter. So then they're advancing the separator into branches and they have no idea where they are. I actually think the Inari is a little bit safer when you know what you're doing. Fantastic. Thank you for this clarification. Excellent technical points. Mehdi, over to you. Let me ask a, a, a question that you know actually happened to me. And uh, so we, we, we cut a big piece of uh, cloth and uh, it was stuck at the tip of the 24 French Inari. Uh, so we brought it down to the sheet, you know, and it was at the tip of the sheet and, you know, everybody has a different ideas. You know, my fellows are yelling at me that somebody else is saying something else. And, you know, there's all these ideas, bring a disc from the top, you know, do some jump or jack, you know, I don't know. And, um, I, I want to hear from you. I, I'll be honest with you. We lost the cloth, so I had to go chase it again. <laughs> but, you know, do you have any good ideas? I mean, the ideas that were, when we were being considered, it was too painful at the time to, like, get access on the neck, bring it a uh, big disc, do that. Do you have any tricks for this, Chris or Jay or June? You missed my Twitter. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's called lollipopping. <laughs> <laughs> 
Not even, <laughs> that's, like, that's what it's like. Um, so you bring the clat uh, right into your dry, like right by your dry seal. Right. Um, and then what you were supposed to do is actually then, uh, I, I actually uh, drew another suction on the catheter and I drew suction on the dry seal, have someone kind of hold pressure the groin as somebody else walks those two catheters off the wire while applying negative suction. It takes like five hands, but um, so you're supposed to actually take the entire clot out and the entire system out. And just it, 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 yeah. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have to stay negative as you pull it into the IVC, but then watch on floor and stop at the dry seal. Because if you keep pulling at the dry seal, you shear it off. Uh, yeah. That's the uh, so you maintain the lollipop, uh, as June was saying, but that was beautifully described. Yeah, I agree. The only thing I'll add is if it's a 24 French sheath um, and you've allowed time for it to entrain into the catheter you know, that 45 second, then 45 second, then another 30 second, then train time, you usually will pull this much clot into the tip of that catheter. And then it's actually rare to lose it on the tip of the sheath. But, but you know, everything they described is how to do it. I tend to actually get those to come all the way out the valve. That's why you always want to do a 24 French sheath, even if you have a 20 French catheter. Jay, last yes. question to you. Do you ever see pulmonary infarction in these patients? Uh, acutely on CT and does it change your tricks? Uh, because you've mentioned a few very interesting tricks. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, um, pulmonary infarction, wedge infarctions, and, uh, and uh, kind of um, these kind of border zones or these watershed zones, you know, out in the periphery are extremely common uh, in patients with significant clot burden. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the concern that, the theoretical concern that arises in those patients is that administration of lytics uh, may lead to pulmonary hemorrhage at a higher rate. Uh, the key thing to recognize is that uh, these patients don't tend to have, uh, you know, you, the reason you're not getting larger pulmonary infarcts with uh, PE is because the bronchial arteries are the blood supply for the lungs, not the pulmonary arteries, which are really designed to just pass blood through and get oxygenated and keep the party moving in terms of cardiac output. Um, so um, the, uh, that concept that uh, pulmonary hemorrhage is going to be more likely uh, is thus far not borne out in any kind of observational data, uh, really. So it doesn't, it doesn't affect our decision making um, to utilize uh, catheterectolysis in, uh, in some of those cases personally. But I'd be curious if June or Chris disagree. Yeah, I had one patient that, you know, I did catheter directed lysis and she had a pulmonary infarct and she had a little bit of a hemoptosis, but nothing bad that came out of it, honestly. It was just a little bit of him. I got scared. I thought maybe I'd done something. And then I went back. I actually had missed it. This was many years ago. I was, you know, my previous institution. I thought that, you know, uh, I, I thought that, uh, you know, I didn't pay attention to the infarct and the CT. And then we lysed her. She, after the procedure, she went to the floor and they called me. They said, she's coughing up blood a little bit. I thought I was like, oh my God, I may have perforated something. And then when we went to the angio. We didn't see anything. We went to CT. There was an infarct. But it was nothing, nothing bad. I agree with Jay. I think that it's uh, unlikely to cause, uh, I don't know, uh, Chris or uh, June, have you experienced anything bad from that? No, I completely agree. I, I will have no hesitation. Jay, if you have any reference or case report, please send it to me. Uh, our, our, at our center, the IR and the, our uh, critical care folks are a little bit reticent but, uh, in using lysis, but I agree with you. But uh, if you have anything that you can cite, that would be fantastic. But I really, really enjoyed this conversation, Mary. I can't tell yes, you one more how question. much I learned from each of one, these presentations. One more question. I want to ask one more question. I know we are over time, but one more question. First of all, at one point, we had over 110 attendees, 110. Right now, we have about 90. Uh, so there are still people that are learning something, and I'm learning something. Sometimes I'm having difficulty and uh, in people that have uh, maybe some degree of chronic pulmonary hypertension, uh, you know, their right lung becomes a little bit anterior. Uh, you know, it rotates, you know, sometimes anterior, sometimes posterior, who knows. But it's, there's a little bit of a rotation. And there's a little bit of a difficulty getting actually to a right lung. Chris, you're right. 90% of the time, right is easier. And it makes sense because after right, it just flips to the left. But when you are having difficulty getting to the right lung, what are some of the tricks you use? I mean, you know, uh, you know, because sometimes it's so rotated that even if you put the multi, if you put a Navicross or even a multi-purpose or even a GR4, as soon as you try to pass that one centimeter super stiff, 
you know, it comes to the left. Any particular tricks for that, you know, Chris? Well, you know, again, as I've mentioned, I have my guide wire buried pretty deeply. So once I get, if, so sometimes I'll cross with a swan, you know, up through the pulmonic valve, and then I'm just having trouble getting into the right. In those situations, I will change for a pigtail, a five French pig and wire with a glide through that to get into the right PA, but then I get it out pretty distally. And then, to be honest, it's gonna sound crazy, but as I'm coming around that turn into the right PA, I move very quickly. And what will happen is, you know, if you have your catheter parked and you bring that amplats in, if you go too slow, it'll flip to the left. But if you take that first curve really quickly and can then control the catheter, it'll bend back and then settle. Um, but it is a little bit of a feel thing that I'll, I'll agree with. But I think the one thing that you pointed out that maybe even myself, I have chickened out, you know, even though I agree with you that, you know, if you go to those two, two branches in the basal branches of the uh, lower lobe, you can really go past the diaphragm yes. and lay, the, lay your wire down deep. I think that, you know, if you're careful and you, the, the technique that you described, meaning that if you use a glide gold or a, or a glide advantage, you know, loop it go straight down past the diaphragm and then lay your uh, lay your uh, multi-purpose or or your navy cross down there that gives you enough purchase uh, to uh, to be able to pass your stiff angle you know super stiff amplex i think what happens is that a lot of us may not go that deep and then in the, in the process the super stiff or your catheter comes back and then you get into trouble because you don't have enough purchase to advance the devices anyway Listen, I learned myself, I learned so much and you guys are fantastic. Uh, you know, thank you so much for staying so late. Thanks to our uh, attendees. Even now we have 86, 87 folks uh, still listening to us. Uh, it's been a great experience. I'm grateful to Inari and Boston for their support. And uh, Subhash, as usual, you get the last word. Maybe I just want to say, I think the three of our speakers, I think they have, it is, I truly I can tell you that I listen to a lot of lectures <laughs> and give a few, but I think this is a testament to good lecturing on web. I think this is the ideal way. Chris, June, and Jay, I think I've heard you guys many times, but I think you hit it out of the park tonight. Uh, right. Technical tips and tricks is unbelievable with logic of sequence really resonated with, with I think, all, the, all of the audience. You can see the chat questions and others. I'm sure this will be a major hit. I really thank you and appreciate you. And Mehdi, your concept of this doing this is amazing. I think this has been a learning session and the two-part phase has been absolutely spectacular. So thanks and hats off to you all and have a very, very good night.